Amidst the turbulent backdrop of the Allied invasion of Sicily in July 1943, a defining moment unfolded. Operation Fustian. The valiant soldiers of Brigadier Gerald Lathbury's 1st Parachute Brigade, an integral part of the revered British 1st Airborne Division, had a resolute objective, the formidable Premisole Bridge. The bridge, a solitary conduit spanning the Scimitar River, held the key to unlocking the vast expanse of the Catania Plain for the British 8th Army. Its capture, a beacon of hope, promised to hasten their advance and herald the imminent demise of the Axis Dominion over Sicily. Meticulous planning envisioned a two-pronged assault, with the brigade's paratroopers descending from the heavens while glider-borne reinforcements stood steadfast by their side. But time was of the essence, as control of the strategically vital bridge meant the safety and security of the surrounding terrain until the arrival of the advancing British 13th Corps. Two Rivers It was a sunny July day in 1943 when Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily, began. The British and Canadians landed south of Syracuse, while the Americans landed farther south and west near Gela. General Bernard L. Montgomery's 8th Army led the beach landings and encountered little resistance from the Italian coastal defenders. By 8 a.m. on July 10th, the British 5th Division entered Casabile and marched past Syracuse, with some troops diverting into the city. Simultaneously, the main force struck north along the coastal road toward Augusta. However, on July 11th, the advance was halted by Group Schmalz, a battle group of the 15th Panzer Division, which was well dug in and supported by Tiger tanks and anti-tank guns. They were reinforced by troops from the German 1st Parachute Division, which the Allies were unaware of, and positioned a machine gun battalion close to a bridge. The Allies planned two Special Forces operations. The mission, assigned to Brigadier John Dunlap Slater's commandos and the 1st Parachute Brigade, implied landing behind enemy lines to seize important bridges on the road north. The commandos would have to capture the bridge over the Malati River, and the 1st Parachute Brigade would seize the Primisole Bridge over the Semeto River. If they succeeded, Montgomery's armored units would be free to move forward and relieve the airborne troops. The operation's success was critical, as it would enable the Allied forces to advance toward Catania and prevent the enemy from establishing defensive lines on the two rivers. On the move. The commandos were to land near Agnoni, advance inland, and capture the Ponte de Malati Bridge over the River Leonardo. Meanwhile, 1,856 paratroopers were to drop from the air five miles to the north and take the Ponte de Primasole, the only bridge over the River Semeto. The plan was risky, but necessary, to turn the tide of the war. Number 3 Commando had already launched a successful assault on a coastal battery near Casabile. Despite some small arms fire, the commandos captured the battery without any losses. The landings were planned in two waves, with the first two troops advancing immediately to capture the bridge. The remaining troops would hold the beach, waiting for the second wave to arrive. More troops would move inland, with a patrol contacting the paratroops at the Primasole Bridge, while another would link up with the 50th Division, advancing up the Catania Road. Dumfried Slater was concerned about the lack of time to plan the Agnone landing. Still, intelligence indicated that the Malati Bridge was only lightly defended by the Italians. Montgomery remained positive and encouraged Dumfried Slater to push forward with the operation, saying, quote, Everybody is on the move now. The enemy is nicely on the move. We want to keep him that way. You can help us to do that. Good luck, Slater. The Drop Zone the roughly 1,900 men would be transported in 116 transport aircraft, 8 Wacos, and 11 Horsa gliders. They would fly from Tunisia to Malta, turn north to reach the southern tip of Sicily, and then fly up the east coast to their drop zone. The mission involved four drop zones and two landing zones, with the closest ones being reserved for the 1st Parachute Battalion, which had the critical task of seizing both ends of the bridge as quickly as possible. The leading troops from the main 8th Army forces were expected to arrive midday on July 14th, so the paratroops would only have to hold out for half a day. The Italian forces had strong fortifications on the hills south of the bridge, beach defenses to the east, and a fortified zone to the side of the road north to Catania. In contrast, the British had a forward observation party from the Royal Artillery and two naval bombardment teams directing naval fire support from a nearby cruiser. The mission's objective was to create a suitable defensive perimeter by capturing the fortified hills after the bridge was seized. 
three parachute battalions would land simultaneously within two miles of the bridge, but it wouldn't be long before the Allies encountered the first obstacle. Setbacks On the night of July 13th, 1943, the British paratroopers geared up. The 1st Battalion was tasked with capturing the bridge, while the 2nd and 3rd Battalions would land to the south and north, respectively, to prevent any enemy incursions. In addition, the gliders would also land in the same designated zones. As they began their descent, the paratroopers were immediately met with several challenges. The Allied fleet offshore and Axis air defenses opened fire on them as they crossed the naval air exclusion zone, resulting in the loss of 11 aircraft and damage to 50 others. Unfortunately, only 12 officers and 283 men out of the 1,856 paratroopers made it to their drop zones, with most of the pathfinders dropped away from the designated areas. This made it challenging to mark the glider landing zones accurately. Despite the setbacks, the scattered paratroopers eventually found each other and headed towards the bridge, where they were confronted by German troops. Captain J. Ran led a force of 50 paratroopers and managed to reach the bridge at 2 a.m. and remove the demolition charges. By night's end, 164 paratroopers had successfully reached the bridge. To the south, around 110 men occupied Johnny One, a crucial hill. However, without support weapons or radios, they could not call in any supporting fire. The small British force was then attacked by their German counterparts. Higher ground the British were able to hold on to the bridge while the rescuers arrived. At nightfall, however, the enemy pushed them south to a nearby ridge. Through the night, small formations of paratroopers continued to wander into the bridge. Lieutenant Colonel John Frost took his men to higher ground to look over the bridge. In turn, Brigadier Gerald Lathbury deployed another 40 elements to both sides of the river. As the morning progressed, the situation at the Malati Bridge was increasingly dire. More German tanks had arrived, along with three battalions of a Panzer Grenadier regiment and an Italian group of tanks and infantry. A German counterattack came from the north. There were about 200, with the support of an 88mm battery from Catania Airfield. Nevertheless, more commandos arrived from the beach. They attempted to work their way to the enemy flank, but to no avail. With the Tiger tank positioned on the other side of the bridge, almost out of range of the PAITs, any attempt to approach it over open ground was unthinkable. The battle broke out and evolved during the day, when another 120 soldiers reached the landmark. Despite the fierce counterattack on the part of the Germans, the British repelled them several times, until the ammunition ran out. Under fire The situation for the British was becoming increasingly hopeless, with their troops concentrated at the southern tip of the bridge. Dumfried Slater had to acknowledge that they were rapidly losing control of the situation. The 50th Division was nowhere to be seen, and casualties were mounting due to mortar and tank fire. And so the leader ordered his men to break into small groups and hurry back to British lines. Most were able to do so, although some groups were cut off and forced to continue the fight, keeping the bridge under fire. By 6 a.m. on July 14th, most of the survivors of the bridge had successfully retreated to the hill. If they planned to resume the attack, the exhausted British needed a well-deserved rest. Meanwhile, five miles to the north, a similarly frantic fight was taking place at the Primisoli Bridge over the Sumetar River. The airborne troops had stirred up a hornet's nest and were coming under increasing enemy pressure. Holding both ends of the bridge, the British fought off continuous infantry attacks with rifles and Bren guns while enduring artillery and mortar fire, and even strafing from Focke-Wulf 190 fighter bombers. Despite repeated attempts by the Germans to take the bridge by storm, the British paratroops held firm. A defensive line. Operation Fustian was the last great airborne operation of the British in the lands of Sicily and Italy. In truth, the operation was a mixed success. Though the bridge was initially taken by the British, it was later retaken by the Germans. Yet, despite the heavy toll of over 150 casualties, No. 3 Commando did not falter. They held the Malati Bridge and removed the demolition charges, ensuring that it remained serviceable when the 50th Division arrived at last. This operation proved to be a lesson for the remainder of the war, as the gliders continued to be used in the Mediterranean, Yugoslavia, Greece, and the south of France. And it was the wisdom gleaned from Operation Fustian that paved the way for the coup de main operations of glider-borne troops during the D-Day landings in Normandy. Capturing the Primasole Bridge did not lead to the expected rapid advance, as the Germans were quick to establish a defensive line. 
the Eighth Army had to wait a few more weeks to finally capture Catania. Thank you for watching this exciting adventure. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up and show us some love. Become a part of our Dark Docs community by hitting the subscribe button today and keeping up with our latest episodes. Stay tuned.